Hello everybody, I welcome you to online course on fundamentals of electric deposition and applications to energy conversion systems. The course is going to be instructed by my colleague Dr. Vasilic from University of Bristol and myself. My name is Danko Brankovic and I am professor at the University of Houston. Uh, this course will address some fundamentals of the electric deposition as much as it could be done in one session and also will focus to some practical aspects and application of the electric deposition to synthesis of the materials for energy conversion systems. Both instructors, me and Dr. Vasilievich, uh, are basically using electric deposition in our research and this is one of the uh, main topics of our uh, research portfolio for the last 20 years and we will try to bring you closer certain uh, knowledge and practical uh, aspects of this phenomenon. We will start first with the electric deposition fundamentals and we will discuss certain terminology. Well, first we have to understand the electrochemical equilibrium is a dynamic equilibrium which basically means that at our electrode surface we have electro dissolution or electro deposition of the metal going on at the same time. In equilibrium both reactions occur at the same rate and therefore the net reaction is zero. The equilibrium is happening or is defined by the potential at which electrode uh, basically is resting which is defined by nursed. The nurse equation shown here is presenting that uh, value of the potential that we need to hold the electrode in order to secure the equilibrium. It's a function of the metal ion activity in the solution and for the very small dilution of uh, for a small concentration of the metal ions in the solution, we can approximate activity with concentration. Uh, we will use this approximation uh, along with the rest of the presentation. So we have to appreciate the fact that application of the potential to the electrode surface could drive one of these two reactions uh, to become a dominant one. If the applied potential E is such that the net difference between equilibrium and applied potential is uh, positive, then we are talking about conditions of under potential and metal dissolution reaction is favored. However, if the applied potential is such that the difference between applied and equilibrium potential is negative, then we are talking about eta, which is common denomination for our potential, and the electrode at our potential conditions uh, supposedly favors the reaction of metal deposition or metal ion reduction. There is a sweet exception to this. At under potential deposition conditions, we could have certain deposition phenomenon occurring which we call under potential deposition or UPD. Typically it does happen uh, in uh, systems where we have a noble metal and less noble metal ions. One of the defining rules is that they have to have a very large difference in PZC or work function. Generally I can give you some examples such as gold, copper, where the gold is electrode copper is the metal ion in the solution, gold, lead, platinum, copper, platinum, lead. So obviously you can see there's a difference in nobility and which basically is one of the prelude to observe the UPD phenomenon. Here I'm going to use an example of the gold electrode which is yellow and copper as red. And basically if we sweep the potential from some positive uh, side towards the negative, we will soon encounter a cathodic peak which resembles the formation of, basically represents the formation of the copper UPT monolayer. Then if we continue further, the UPT monolayer will maybe change the structure then supply, but eventually when we exceed the reversible potential for copper, we will start depositing bulk. When we reverse the sweep go to anodic direction, we can dissolve this bulk copper and we're going to stay with copper monolayer on gold. 
and then if we continue further in another direction we will be dissolving the copper monoid. The message to take home is that copper or UPD phenomenon is the potential dependent absorption and it's quite uh, important to appreciate that we can by decision which potential we can hold the electrode at we can actually control the deposition of the copper to a fraction of a monolayer precision. This type of phenomenon and precision of deposition is only available in the electrochemical system and UPD is a really unique phenomenon which we will further exploit in certain applications. Here I just want to give you an example how the true voltammogram for UPD looks like on the example of LED UPD on gold, which is shown here. Here is the STM of the true LED UPD monolayer on gold, which exhibits a uh, more type of the structure uh, due to the compression in the layer. Here you can see the adoption isotherm, which is basically the LED UPD monolayer covered with respect to the under potential. And under potential here is basically defined with respect to the reversible potential of the lead. And you can see that by choice of the under potential, we can deposit very fine control, uh, controlled amount of lead, whether it's uh, just decoration of the defects, whether we want to nucleate and deposit more on the terraces, or we can put the full monolayer. It's just a matter of what kind of under potential we choose. Um, the relation between the coverage and the under potential is well understood. It can be described by certain adsorption model, adsorption editor models, one of I'm showing here with the green line in the graph is uh, defined by Birkenstein Swatarian editor and it's basically Langmuirian based which has Frumkin and Temkin additive parts that, which define the interactions in the or describe the interactions in the layer. When we talk about equilibrium potential defined by Nernst equation, we have to appreciate the fact that you know we could have uh, complications which are related to stability of the metal ion due to the complexation in the solution. So, if we have a strongly complexing anions in the solution which form a stable chelation around the uh, metal ion, then the reversible potential could be actually very different. Uh, the Nernst equation is then a little bit modified and is a function of the reversible potential of the metal ion in standard conditions and then there's a logarithmic term with, which includes the stability constant of the metal ion complex with particular ion defined here. So the example that we need to have in mind are many but here I just give you in this table example of the uh, silver complexation with cyanide ions which can shift the reversible potential of silver more than 1.2 volts in negative direction. This type of the uh, tricks uh, are exercised when we want to do electrode deposition of alloys where we have very dissimilar metals. Uh, for example, we want to bring them closer to each other in terms of their uh, reversible potential so we can avoid some transport limitations during the alloy deposition then we can use complexation and more normal metal can be actually brought closer to the less noble metal in terms of their reversible potentials. Now I would like to discuss the relation between current density and our potential that we observe during the alloy deposition. The most general description of this is given by bottle warmer kinetics where the current density is a function of the exchange current density and the term in the brackets that is basically exponential dependence of the over potential. The alpha A and alpha C represents the transfer coefficients and F, R and uh, constants and T is the temperature. The exchange current density has very uh, complicated uh, description. I'm not going to go into details, but just to tell you that this is the uh, part that describes the chemical dependence of the electrochemical reaction and the term that explains, like, uh, basically takes care of the electro part is the one that involves the over potential. The transfer coefficients are defined in terms of the symmetry of the energy barrier for charge uh, 
transfer the electrode surface and they are defined here and this is pretty much as much as I would say about those terms uh, but a uh, more elaborate description you can find in any textbook. Uh, but hormone kinetics is a hyperbolic, condensed hyperbolic sign type of the relation which could be approximated. And uh, one of the approximation is the Tuffle approximation for very large uh, power potentials. We can basically use the exponential dependence only of the term that is um, showing the cathodic. Uh, Efficient. Uh, <clears throat> if we are talking about small or potentials, then we can use the linear approximation, which is shown here, where the change current density and uh, excuse me, where the current density and our potential have a really linear relation. Uh, depending which one we use, something on you know, the practical decision, and I show you here. On the right, that you can see that BV and Tuffle uh, equations have very good agreement for the over potentials that are larger than 100 millivolts. While if you're talking about linear approximation and BV equations, they have pretty good agreement when you're talking about over potentials that are less than 40 millivolts. You can also see on the left side uh, graph uh, some of the effects that transfer coefficients have on the symmetry of the anodic and cathodic part of the current density and described by battle warmer kinetics where if they equal then we have totally symmetric anodic and cathodic part of the battle warmer uh, uh, kinetics however if they are different then the larger uh, the, whether it's a larger uh, cathodic or anodic uh, transfer coefficient defines where the kinetics of the deposition of the solution is occurring at much higher rate for the same uh, absolute value of the over potential. So, going, you know, we need to address also issues with the transport limitations during the electro deposition, which basically means that we can drive the reaction of the deposition by increasing uh, over potential and the reaction will go faster and faster and which at one point will be uh, limited not anymore by the kinetics but the supply of the ions to the interface will be limited by the diffusion of uh, transport. So first fix of uh, diffusion uh, is the definition of the problem and if we integrate this assuming the linear the <coughs> concentration the boundary layer, linear dependence of the concentration in the boundary layer, we can find that the current density or transport limit current density is function of the concentration in the bulk and concentrations at the interface, their difference, and the diffusion layer thickness. Assuming that we drive the reaction so fast that all the ions at the interface are depleted for the metal deposition, then we can get the limiting current. That's the expression shown here. Um, definition of the uh, determination of the uh, <coughs> thickness of the diffusion boundary layer is somewhat different across the different geometries uh, of the electrodes, but I give you here two examples which are mostly most commonly used um, in the literature. One is defined by Levitch for the rotating disk electrode where the diffusion layer thickness is a function of the kinematic viscosity of the water rotation rate and um, diffusivity of the metal ions in the solution. Um, the other definition here shows um, the diffusion boundary layer thickness as a function of the kinematic uh, transport coefficient k, which is defined in terms of the geometry of the pedal cell, which is commonly used in magnetic recording or um, microelectronic applications in industry and depending on the geometry of the pedal which has typically triangular shape which goes in a linear motion back and forth across the uh, rate of surface at a certain distance h uh, with a certain geometry h uh, capital and overall height l uh, then we can define this kinematic uh, transfer coefficient and as a function of this coefficient we can define also uh, diffusion 
layer thickness in the paddle cell. Uh, more elaborate discussions of both approaches are given in these um, uh, references. Because of the transport limitations, we also have an important phenomenon or rise of the phenomenon which is related to concentration over potential. Concentration over potential is a function of the concentrations of the ions in the interface and bulk concentrations. In particular, it's a function of the logarithm of their ratio. And more importantly, you should appreciate that there are different forms of this expression, whether we express the concentration of the interfaces in function in terms of the current density that goes or flows through the interface. We can have a different uh, definition. One important thing is to appreciate is that the contribution of concentration of polarization is very small for any ratio of smaller than 0.9. It's really truly neglectable. Uh, However, when the ratio between the concentration or exchange current density is, uh, excuse me, the position current density approaches the limited one, which is basically above 0.9, the contribution of the concentration polarization becomes the dominant contribution to the observed over potential. And obviously, as we're trying to reach the limiting current density, the over potential has uh, mathematically goes to infinity. In reality, the overpotential versus current density um, relation is shown with a green line, which is basically a combination of both contributions, activation polarization related to the kinetics of the electrode position and concentration polarization related to the transport. In either way, uh, we see a little bit different shape uh, than each of these curves represents, which is the basically uh, related to their uh, contributions each dominating different part of the power potential scale. Now, one of the important things to discuss uh, you know, for electrode position is the unsteady state, which is basically how the current and uh, potential behave uh, during the initial uh, moment when we turn the equipment on and start the position. Well, basically this requires uh, a mathematical treatment of the second uh, fixed law of the diffusion for the final electrode typically. And you basically need to solve this equation for exact solution, meaning that you will get infinite series for your series. Uh, in practicality, we don't use this type of the solution unless we want to play with computers. So basically, there are two uh, approximate solutions of this problem, which are really truly a function of this term here, whether it's bigger or smaller than 0.2. If it's a really smaller than 0.2, the sense equation shows you a pretty good uh, description of the concentration profile at the interface as a function of time. And it gives you a really important parameter here, which we call transition time tells you how long time has to pass from the moment you turn on the current of the position for a constant current value until the concentration of the interface drops to zero. Uh, you can see that this relation for the transition time is a function of the current efficiency which typically you know could be one or less than one if we have parasitic reaction going on, applied current and it's a quadratic uh, one inverse of the quadratic function. If this uh, term is bigger than 0.2, then the, you know we have a little bit more elaborate form of the mathematical description of the concentration uh, at the interface as a function of time, and also a little bit more elaborate description of the transition time calculations. Yet what is important to appreciate here is that if we are defining any kind of a pulse current deposition process, which is a very common approach to many deposition uh, uh, practices. Uh, having uh, a rough idea or calculations about what is the transition time in your system is must. Because pulsing with a certain current density is longer than transition time, that's not going to do any good for you. Unless you really truly want to have some powder deposit, something which uh, 
is specific, you always have to design your pulse current duration to be shorter than the transition time. Also, your off time, which is typically current zero, or your equipment has an off time disconnected, in general has to be long enough to allow recovery of the concentrations uh, of the line concentrations at the interface. And in general, the rule is that you know your off time should be about three to four times longer than your pulse time. This comes from the math. I'm not going to present this, but you know more of this you can see in different pulse current deposition handbooks. One thing that is important to appreciate is that generally when we do electrodeposition of metals, not all the metals uh, deposit only as the pure or single reaction. Uh, generally, we also have uh, situations for the metals that are less noble than hydrogen that hydrogen uh, or hydronium ion reduction or hydrogen evolution reaction goes in parallel. And this uh, is very common for iron, cobalt, nickel, zinc, and other metals, uh, lead deposition, cadmium, etc. Um, in that case, what we really truly are looking is a little bit more complex shape of the current or potential uh, dependence. And in general, the goal is always to minimize the hydrogen evolution reaction with respect to metal deposition to increase the current efficiency. And the current efficiency in this case is basically defined as the metal deposition versus the overall current that we're running. And in general, the closer to one it is, the better it is. So for that reason, we try to keep the metal concentration always um, basically um, larger than the hydronium ion concentration, so that we can have a metal deposition current larger than hydrogen evolution current. And in that case, the typical, you know, outlook of the current density or potential um, relation looks like this, where we have two plateaus. First one is the related to the entering limiting current density region for hydrogen evolution. Then, when we exceed the metal reversible potential, then we start to see another drop in the current or increase. Um, and then another plateau, which is basically metal plus hydrogen deposition limiting current. And here and again, this is shown for iron deposition, which has a hydrogen co-deposition current. And you can see it for different um, pH, the shape of the curve starts to look close to what we just described. Keep in mind that here the uh, abscess is having uh, uh, logarithmic, uh, a logarithm of the card. Um, going further, when we discuss um, the magnitudes of the current density, obviously um, one thing that we should keep in mind is that um, there is a certain limits to what type of current density will drive your electrode in what kind of a potential regime. And for that reason, the stability regime of the water is commonly defined by these two reactions, which are hydrogen evolution and oxygen reduction. You should also keep in mind that, you know, as much as you have reaction on your cathode, you also have the same type of the processes in opposite direction going on the anode. So if you typically deposit metals on the cathode, you will most likely have some oxygen evolution on the anode side. Uh, one thing that you should keep in mind is that if you really drive your uh, over potential to negative um, and the electrode surface exceeds this dotted line here, which is about minus 1.2 volts, then you enter in the region where you start direct, re direct reduction of the water. So this is not hydrogen evolution reaction as defined here, although there is an abundant hydrogen presence when you start doing direct reduction of the water. But it's a different reaction because here your reactant is water molecule. And water molecule basically in terms of molarity is 55 more 
of a leader. So basically, once you enter this regime, basically most of your current will be related to the water uh, reduction, really less to mellow the position. Uh, if you don't have to go there, I strongly suggest you to think twice why you want to also do some high current density if you're going to be reducing water. Yeah, typically these regimes are um, reserved when we are doing certain specific processes such as the electrochemical um, cutting or you know, some specific processes which are really not truly uh, moving transfer to the position. Uh, in this relation uh, to um, the <coughs> certain range of the current density that we want to choose, etc., you know, for certain metals we want to be also aware when we design the solution that the pH range where the solution should be designed is very much dependent on the stability of the metal ions in the solution and some uh, metal ions are prone to also form hydroxides which are insoluble and then stability of your solution like for example here iron is something that might be uh, an issue so generally uh, uh, using the example of the iron I would like to tell you that uh, just looking simply at the poor bay diagram you do not want to create a solution for iron unless you're using some complexation and other stuff which are too high in pH because it would be basically precipitating ionic hydroxide whether it's iron 2 or iron 3 hydroxide it will start to basically precipitate important thing when we talk about also is that for example um, iron 2 ions which are common source for iron electro deposition practice uh, oxidized by dissolved oxygen from the air which typically at normal pressure is about 2.6 times that of minus 4 molar uh, concentration in the water or basically in the solution and for that reason this oxygen will oxidize iron 2 into iron 2 and iron 3 and if you follow the accumulation of iron 3 uh, as a function of time from iron 2 plus the solution you can come up with the rate of this uh, generation which is basically equal to the slope of this here and I give you the calculation here. Why is this important? Because iron 3 forms one of the most insoluble hydroxides and if you have too much iron 3 in your solution your solution stability will be compromised. More important so along the previous discussion and using the example of iron 3 plus um, I would like to emphasize the very important fact that when we do have electrodeposition of the metals which happen to have a uh, codeposition of uh, hydrogen uh, involved in this process, then we have to appreciate the fact that interfacial pH uh, at the electrode surface is always very much higher than the bulk. In particular, when we talk about iron 3 plus, it forms the most one of the most insoluble hydroxides where the product of solubility is very, very small. Therefore, understanding uh, the situation and interface is of great importance. Because of the evolution of the hydrogen at the interface, the IH plus or ions are depleted, and that means that the interfacial pH could be significantly higher. Therefore, um, even if we have a uh, iron 3 plus in the solution and the solution might look the clean, where basically we don't see directly evidence of the iron 3 hydroxide precipitation, and the interface solution actually could behave differently. And the reason is that the interfacial pH could be very much higher and uh, the, uh, the product of solubility between uh, OH- and iron 3 plus could be exceeded and that's why we could have a uh, precipitation of hydroxide at the interface while we are doing uh, iron deposition which negatively typically negatively affects the uh, metal deposit uh, properties. Uh, here I give you an expression where we can calculate the maximum limited uh, or allowed concentration of iron 3 in the electrolyte for which 
if it succeeded, the uh, uh, interfacial precipitation of iron-3 hydroxide will start, and it's a function of the product of solubility for iron-3 hydroxide, and a product of water, deposition current density, current efficiency, diffusion layer thickness, and diffusivity of hydrogen ions in the solution. In general, the same type of the expression applies when we talk about other ions that form insoluble hydroxides, which should be very appreciated in terms of uh, designing the process where we do not want this phenomenon of hydrocycle precipitation to occur. Now, the next part of uh, uh, this uh, uh, fundamental uh, lecture is related to thermodynamics and kinetics of nucleation. Now, um, to start with this, I would just uh, remind you on typical uh, description of the group modes which we use in thin film science, which is the fine in terms of the thermodynamic uh, quantity such as surface energy. So these inequalities uh, between surface energy of the substrate and film and interface defines the growth mode, uh, which we recognize as Volmer-Weber or 3D growth, uh, then Frank van der Meer or 2D growth, and Stansky Kastanov, which is the growth transition between 2D and 3D. Um, why is this important to appreciate it? That uh, sometimes, depending how we do uh, electrode position at what over potential we uh, run the process, we could have, uh, interestingly, nucleation of the deposit, which could be preferential on the defects. Typically, in this case, we can only saturate the defect sites with nuclease, while no nucleation happens on the terraces. And that is the case when we have very small over potentials. If you want to look at the same amount of material deposited while well, using a much, very much higher over potentials, we can see that nucleation happens uh, also on the terraces and on the defects. To understand a little bit more about this, I would uh, just point out that uh, depending how we do the process also, we can have perfectly uh, executed 2D growth, like here shown silver on on gold, but also we can have uh, also 3D growth, which is usually not a uh, desired one, which is shown here, platinum and retinue. Um, so, obviously, our potential is important understanding the nucleation phenomenon. When we talk about thermodynamics and nucleation, we're talking about nucleation rate. Nucleation rate is a function of the overpotential, and it's an exponential function where the or potential is the squared within the exponent uh, uh, 1 over the uh, 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 square within the exponent functional. And one important thing to appreciate is that if we have a substrate for our electro deposit, which has a good epitaxial match, let's say we just do homo epitaxial deposition like silver and silver, silver or gold, where the small misfit doesn't create a lot of strain. Then we can use this uh, relation, however, if the substrate has a big misfit, let's say we are trying to deposit silver and platinum or ruthenium or something like that, then the strain in the nucleation uh, or in the nuclei starts to play an important role in energetics of the nucleation and generally the nucleation rate will be different for the same applied over potential. Having said that, uh, and just looking into mathematical uh, formulation, you could see that for the same over potential that we apply, depending whether the strain plays an important role or no, we can have quite significant difference in nucleation rate. And we should keep this in mind because sometimes we, would, we could have way different results depositing the same material on two different substrates. Uh, here's a a uh, real um, uh, example when we look into the effect of the uh, value of the overpotential on the nucleation uh, rate and outcome of the electro deposition process for the low nucleation. Uh, for the low overpotential, we can see that nucleation rate is uh, quite uh, small and uh, the deposit 
uh, sporadic it forms without covering the entire surface of our substrate. However, for way much larger nucleation rates uh, and applied over potentials, we can have uniformly forming deposits with much higher nucleation rates on the surface. Obviously, if our interest is to form deposits which are really, really uniform covering surface, we would like to nucleate or design our process where the nucleation step is supported by the large over potential. Uh, when we talk about kinetics of the nucleation or kinetics of the growth, we are not talking about nucleation rate anymore, we are talking about nucleation density. To elaborate a little bit further on this, uh, I will explain that the growth modes when we consider kinetics of the thin film growth are not defined in terms of the, nuclei, uh, in terms of the thermodynamic uh, values, but rather in terms of the three different uh, length scales that are mutually competing and whose mutual relation is defined in the growth mode. The first length scale is L alpha here, uh, which basically defines the strength of the shorter barrier, which is an extra barrier for an air atom by diffusing on top of the cluster to step down and incorporate into glowing layer. The second one is the L sub s, which is um, the length scale defined by the average width of the terraces, which is the function of the angle of the miscut with respect to the low index plane of our surface and the average height of the step. The third uh, length scale is basically Ln, L sub n, which is the represents the inverse square root of the nucleation density defined here, and which is the function of the flux, the position of flux out of the surface, which also has a relation to uh, the position current density. So uh, these competing length scales and their mutual relation define the growth mode. In the first case when we have L sub n much larger than L sub s, that means that the terraces are really short and the probability of nucleation is very low and most of the atoms that land on the terraces will diffuse into the steps so we will have a stable step flow growth. However, if the opposite is true, then we can have a relation where L sub alpha is much larger than L sub n, which means that uh, probability for nucleation on top of the cluster is much larger than probability for the air atom to step down and incorporate in the growing layer, which typically results in a pyramidal growth, rough 3D growth. In the opposite case, uh, when L sub alpha is much smaller than L sub n, what that really means is that all air atoms that land on the top of the clusters will be fused and incorporate in the growing layer and we will have a 2D growth. Uh, we try sometimes to achieve 2D growth by uh, manipulating the growth uh, conditions or conditions for electron deposition in order for systems that basically typically or naturally grow 3D to force them to go in 2D mode and this is typically achieved by increasing the creation density or basically increasing the flux uh, then mitigating the, the strength of the uh, Schreiber barrier and basically the length scale I sub alpha and uh, more details how we do this in electric deposition I will address in the following slides uh, before I go and explain a few tricks how we can do this, I would like to uh, point out a few uh, relations which are of interest for us. Basically, uh, just simply looking at the nucleation uh, density, which is a function of flux, and flux is a function of the current density. We can say that for activation control regime, or uh, for the small over potentials, which is typically linear, uh, approximation of the battle warmer equation, we see that nucleation density is a third root of the over potential functional. Yet, uh, when we are talking about top regime of the battle warmer equation, which means exponential dependence of the current with respect to the over potential, it is easily shown that nucleation density is also exponentially dependent on the over potential. In the concentration polarization regime, we don't have functional that clearly links the over potential 
through the nucleation uh, density. It's also important for you to appreciate one thing that basically, uh, based on this relation I just said, when we have an electrogeometry which is really, really small, where the dimensions of the electrode scale with the average distance between nuclei is called L sub n, then we can have a peculiar conditions where, uh, depending on our flux of the position current density, we can nucleate one or many nuclei within the boundaries of the nano confinement of our electrode. To give you an example here, this is a, a photoresist nano uh, structure which is of order of, you know, several tens of nanometers and uh, depends how you run your process, if you adjust your current density or the position flux that this relation is valid. Then what happens is that you generate only one nuclei in this confinement and you have a single crystal deposit within this nano confined electrode geometry. This is also evident when the deposit mushrooms on top of the photoresist, then the shape of the deposit starts to take the shape of the cuboctahedra, which is the equilibrium shape of a uh, single crystal for uh, FCC metals, such as nickel, for example, here. We can also drive the process in a different way where the average separation between the nuclei is, is actually smaller than the confinement of the electrode. In this case, interestingly enough, we can have two nuclei, which is shown here, we can, which uh, basically can form a twin. And, you know, if we even increase more the position flux, we can have more than one or two or three or five nuclei within the boundary of the nano confinement, and we can have polycrystalline deposits. For many applications, I would like to say, when we come to this nanostructure, single crystallinity is preferred. Now, um, switching the gear uh, and relating to what I just said, you know, obviously we can make some systems that grow 3D, for example, um, to grow 2D. Uh, and in particular, the uh, electrode position is successful. Uh, by mitigating this uh, problem using surfactants. Now, surfactants are generally considered materials, in our case, metals that have a low surface energy and if they're deposited on the surface, they float because they have a lower surface energy than the metal we try to grow. And interestingly enough, that condition is uh, fulfilled by most of the UPD metals if we are considering growth of the, some kind of a more noble metal. So basically what surfactants do, uh, depending whether we have them in a low coverage or high coverage regime, they mitigate the height of the Schreiber barrier, which means they uh, increase the, uh, uh, they decrease the uh, uh, energy needed for an atom to step down. Or if they are really in a full coverage regime, then they mitigate the step uh, barrier and also mitigate the diffusion process on the terraces. And with respect to that, you know, we can actually make system that goes typically 3D, grows 2D because we significantly reduce the length scale uh, related to the uh, step-down processes I discussed before L sub alpha. And here's an example where we uh, grow uh, silver on gold, which is typically rough 3D growth um, by uh, using a constant current deposition where the uh, current uh, or potential at which we are doing the process is designed in such a way that at the same time while we are growing silver in over potential deposition regime which means we are in over potential for silver growth we are also at UPD uh, potential for lead and so which really means that we can have a stable lead monolayer on the growing silver surface. So you can see here two uh, sweeps for the solutions with lead and without lead ions uh, uh, and with silver ions present. And you can see that this uh, peak here represents the lead UPT on the growing silver surface. So when we have about 0.8 monolayers of lead on the growing silver surface serving as a surfactant, what we actually can achieve is that the rough or this starting gold surface looking like this can end up being covered with the silver film that is actually much smoother than the starting 
surface, that's one thing. Also, if you look at the sil uh, gold surface, which has step bunches, uh, after the start of the growth with the surfactant presence, we can see the debunching of these steps, which means the step flow proceed, which is one of the signature of the surfactant-mediated growth. In reality, if we do a look at this in situ, we can see that basically the step bunches here present on gold start to debunch and move in this direction due to the presence of the surfactant on the surface, which is the signature again of the significantly reduced uh, uh, Freuber barrier or barrier for the ad atom step down process. The other um, approach is called defect mediated growth and again involves the solution where we grow some group of metals such as for example silver and gold uh, in the presence of lead ions and lead ions have a role serving as a surfactant as well as the flux mitigators or um, uh, enhancers. In this particular case uh, the current or the potential of the surface is not constant and it's basically uh, constantly changes we are sweeping the potential between certain limits and so what that does is basically uh, makes the lead come to the surface while we're growing silver and slips from the surface that enhances the nucleation which is the good because it improves the situation where the clusters become smaller and the step down process is facilitated but also it does all the things that surfactant growth already does basically you can see here the clusters that you know we observe the size of the clusters on which the nucleation on top starts to happen is actually that those clusters are much bigger and that's one of the indications that we are mitigating the barrier for step down process and so how this really works is that basically we have silver and lead in the solution we are in our potential deposition regime for silver as you can see here but we are also uh, sweeping potential in the UPD uh, regime for lead so as we keep changing the potential back and forth between these two limits what we happen to do is basically we are depositing silver and co-depositing with lead UPD monolayer which is reversibly also dissolved on the surface in a single sweep what it does is basically increase enhances the inflation density modifies the Schroeder barrier and in each cycle we are basically letting those preformed silver nuclei to merge into a complete layer uh, achieving basically very high quality deposit if we keep continuing this over and over and over we basically end up with a very high quality silver film uh, on the gold uh, surface in this particular case this is a silver single crystal film not single crystal gold uh, surface now um, I would like to also talk about uh, additives uh, in electric deposition process, but before that, uh, I would like to introduce you terms which are related to uh, electrified interface and certain uh, uh, properties. So, when we talk about metals in contact with electrolytes, uh, there is a spontaneous phenomenon or phenomenon of electrical field uh, uh, across the interface forming spontaneously. Uh, due to the effect that the spillover of electron functions from the metal is basically facing the charged particles in the electrolyte which happen to mimic this charge with opposite ion charge and this basically means that we face the certain capacitance phenomenon due to this presence of the charged species facing electron cloud on the side of the electrode surface that charging has nothing to do with electron transfer and those electrodes that we actually can have only charging and discharging of the double layers are called ideally for a lot of polarizable electrode in the certain potential regime now um, one of the models of the uh, electrified interface is called Helmholtz model and it's a simple power plate capacitor model which basically assumes that the electron uh, spillover from the side of the metal uh, is met by the charge of the opposite sign from the side of the solution as a two parallel plates so basically the distance of the plate is of order of 10 to the minus 9 meters and the capacity of this uh, 
parallel plate capacitor could be calculated in terms of the dielectric constant of free space, water, and the distance between them is 1 over A here. Uh, and for the solutions that are having uh, more than 10 to minus 2 molar concentration of the uh, salts or charged uh, electrolytes, we basically have a pretty good uh, estimate of the capacity of the double layer, which is very good considering how simplistic this model is. This is a very good approximation of the reality. Yet, when we are talking about the uh, concentrations of the electrolyte that are very low, which are about 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4, and so on, the diffuse part of the double layer starts to play an important role, and that's the part that is not uh, very uh, uh, immediate next to the surface, but the one that is actually diffused through the thermal motion and there's no much organization. That's a good Chapman model, and basically it describes the differential capacity of the surface as a function of the potential with respect to the potential of zero charge, which I'm going to mention in a moment, and the concentration of the uh, ions in the solution. The important thing here is that this model defines the existence of the potential of zero charge, or we call this E physics C. And for that potential, we assume that uh, the capacity of the electrode has its minimum. Um, this potential of zero charge basically understood in a way that uh, one can think of the maximum disorder at the electrified interface uh, between charged particles, where the probability of positive and negative particles, positive side or negative side of the di dipole facing the electrode surface is about the same. For that reason, the capacity is minimal. In reality, Stern's model is probably the best approximation or best interpretation of the double layer and capacity, where basically it involves both models and um, depending, you know, which where the capacity is described by the uh, uh, these two models uh, in series, uh, capacity of the Hempholtz and uh, Guy Chapman uh, uh, linked in series, and obviously for low ion concentration, the capacity of the double layer is defined by the um, uh, diffused part of the double layer or Guy Chapman model, and for ion. Uh, concentration which is higher, about less, uh, larger than 10 to minus 2 molar, then the double layer capacity is defined by the simply Hempholtz model or accurately interpreted by Hempholtz model. In general, you know, we should use the full form if we want really accurate description, or we can use approximate forms if we really looking just to have a hint uh, how the double layer um, capacity depends on the potential. Now, I'm um, going to discuss the additive effect in the electrode deposition. I'm going to give you a basically anecdotal uh, story uh, what basically historically additives used to be uh, considered uh, for, and those were organic substances that magically thrown in the solution. You were very bright, very high reflective. Uh, type of the deposit, typically for nickel and copper, you know, and some other metal. And the uh, general description goes about that we have always some kind of a duality of the rows where the level are formed to film on the surface, which is uh, difficult for metal ions to penetrate, and then the brightener locally perturbs this uh, film in uh, uh, specific regions where the, we have the valleys. And as it perturbs this layer, the ions have an easier uh, path to go through this perturbed part of the layers and reduce on the surface, which creates basically the outcome where the surface gradually smooths out and becomes highly reflective. Of course, this story is not really supported by too much of the scientific evidence, but uh, the real story is way more complex. 
The bottom line is that we, we uh, consider using some organic substance as an additive to keep has to absorb on the surface and one of the signatures of the adsorption process of the organic um, substance is the creation of this capacitor spell which broadens out if we are increasing the concentration of the additive in the solution. So, typical um, rule uh, is that generally uh, additives are larger molecules which have a small dipole and they can only effectively compete for adsorption site on the surface when basically the probability or disorder in the uh, head interface is uh, maximized by by the fact that we are close to the potential of zero charge then they can actually effectively compete with water molecules or you know metal or other uh, positively or negatively charged species and actually absorb on the surface to give you a an idea you know when we have an additive in the in the solution or organic material that we want to consider it as the additive at about region of the pzc close to that you know, we should see a capacitance swell presence uh, with respect uh, to uh, the potential if we study this. Um, and eventually, if we keep increasing the concentration of the additive, you know, the capacitance well will start to broaden out. That's a very good idea that our really uh, additive is absorbing on the surface, which means it does what it's supposed to do. Now, if you go away from PZC, okay, uh, in this direction or this direction, what happens is that additives are basically squeezed out by the charged particles which compete with, with the charge on the electrode surface and try to counterbalance it. So, if we are really looking into using certain molecules as an additive, we have to have a good idea where is the PZC of the metal which we try to deposit and whether these molecules actually do absorb significantly on the surface in this region. And if they do, we should run the electrolytic position process in such a way that we would like to be uh, having electrode potential during the deposition process in this range where the additive does absorb. Now, these measurements which I just explained to you about capacitance are generally done by using doing impedance measurements and this is a typical model uh, of the impedance uh, circuit that is used to model impedance data to extract the double air capacitance charge transfer coefficient and other things i'm not going to go into too detail because impedance spectroscopy by itself could be a course of its own but here just the example is on the uh, saccharine which is a common additive in the position of magnetic materials cobalt, iron, nickel, uh, and these impedance measurements extracting uh, from them the double air capacitance shows you uh, how this depends on the uh, electrode uh, potential and you can see using the Fromkin relation for the coverage of the uh, organic material as a function of the double air capacitance you can see that the maximum coverage is somewhere between one, minus 1 1.2 and minus 1.3 volts with respect to the zero, zero chloride electron. So obviously the most effective action of the saccharine for this particular material, which is cobalt nickel iron, is in this uh, potential regime. Now why is that important? Okay, well one of the important advantages that electrode deposition has among many others, not because we want to have a bright deposit, but we want to also improve the properties of uh, our deposits with respect to other uh, competing deposition uh, methods. So one of the magic that uh, electrode deposition has using additives is that we can effectively mitigate the level of stress in the deposit. So if you think this about the stress uh, thickness uh, curve, it's dominated in the very beginning by nucleation phenomenon, which drives the stress into compressive regime. And then, as the nuclei grow and start to merge into complete layer, the green boundary zipping process defines the stress signature, which goes and turns out relaxation and stays tensile uh, as the you know film thickens and increases thickness. 
Okay, so for the metals that are typically of interest, uh, which have a low surface diffusivity and that probably don't have any side effects of hydrogen, hydride formation, etc., this is the typical stress uh, uh, thickness curve if we do electric deposition without additives. So if we do add additives, which one you know, in particular and how, which is discussed, you know, how to use them and so on, then the stress suddenly drops down, which significantly uh, improves the functionality of the, our coating or film because the low stress levels means you can go thick, you can do a lot of stuff with these coatings if the stress levels are high, typically this results in thin film delamination and failure. So when we talk about corrosion protection, for example, chromium, that's one of the things that people need to worry about. One of the models that I'm going to discuss is basically um, assuming that what additives do, they change the thermodynamics of the surface and change the surface energy of the growing metal and also the grain boundary energy of the growing metal. And so what that really means is that uh, because of that different energetics anymore, the benefit of grain zipping to reduce the overall energy of the system is not so large anymore because the surface energy that's supposed to be decreased by the grain zipping process is not so high anymore. So the driving force for grain zipping decreases and that overall results in a decrease of the stress in the deposit. So the effect of additives and the model that explains the effect of the concentration of additives in the solution to the resulting stress in the deposit or the maximum stress in the deposit is shown in this relation here where uh, saccharine or additive concentration is shown. Here this is equilibrium absorption constant of the additive and this term here is um, a specific term that I'm going to explain in the moment and this is the maximum stress that we have without additives if we do a preposition what is the stress in the deposit uh, uh, without the presence of the, addit of the additives in the solution delta gamma star is a thermodynamic uh, quantity which defines the difference between again the surface energy reduction for surface without additives and the surface with additives minus the reduction of the grain boundary energy for the surface without additives and with additives. And the model explains very well the data as it is shown here and so more details about this uh, effect you can read in this uh, uh, publication but what I try to, to convey to you is that this is only true if you run your process in such a way that the saccharine or additive that you use absorbs on the surface and mitigates the stress level. If you run your process in such a way that you have saccharine, for example, in the solution, but its potential of the surface is on some faraway place where no saccharine is present, you will still have a high stress deposit. So it's essential that you understand where are your additives that you use in your process, absorb at what potentials, and that's how you actually end up being uh, effective uh, in terms of the uh, design of additives for your electric deposition process. So it's not just uh, using the right additive, it's just uh, more than that. It's using your additive and running the process at a right potential with the right current density. Here uh, I also show you another phenomenon that is related to the presence of the additives in the plating solution is that additives do incorporate uh, into the deposit. They either incorporate through electroreduction process where basically the molecule of additive is broken down into fragments and eventually forms some kind of an intermetallic uh, compound with the deposit or it's basically physically trapped and buried in the deposit during the growth. Both of these processes are described by these uh, terms here uh, and they are also a function of the concentration of additives in the solution and those um, electroreduction and physical entrapment constants. So if you have some process that you want to do and you use specific additives at specific uh, conditions 
and you want to study a little bit more, the best idea is to find some tracer element in your attitude, like for example, South Brain and Saccharine, and follow the content of this um, you know, element in your deposit as a function of this uh, concentration of your additive in the plating solution. And what is interesting is you're getting this kind of a behavior in general. It can vary, maybe it can look like this, it can look like that, depending on the ratio between K1 and K2, or basically this uh, electroreduction and electro uh, physical entrapment constants. But what is important for you to appreciate is that once you really define your system and you know what your additive does, how it incorporates and so what's the main mechanism, then it gives you latitude to do some other stuff. For example, uh, understanding the effect of the additives on coercivity is not so easy to distinguish if you uh, follow simple, let's say, coercivity versus additive concentration relation. In that case, you, you're not sure because the relation is just not so obvious. Yet, if you recalculate uh, uh, your um, sulfur content in the deposit or incorporation rate of sulfur, and then you plot the coercivity with respect to that, you will see that this is basically a straight line. So more sulfur from the additive directly contributes to the formation of the softer magnetic deposit. And uh, the sulfur from the deposit incorporated into the uh, lattice creates this order morphization, which is uh, good for uh, magnetic softness. However, not necessarily uh, incorporation of additives is a good thing to, uh, it can affect the corrosion properties of the deposit. And here is the example where we use um, uh, electroxidation potential of the cobalt iron deposited with and without additives. Obviously, without additives, the electroxidation peak or the stripping peak is the most positive. And with additives, obviously, if you look at the red line, this is the maximum incorporation concentration that results in maximum incorporation. And this is the most negative stripping peak. And then, you know, if you use two grams, which is much lower incorporation rate, the peak is shifted to more positive potential. So, uh, so there's an optimum between the benefit and drawback when we think about the overall properties of the deposit. And you need to understand really well what additive do, how it does. Uh, in order to design the best uh, process to, to have the best properties of your material. And just to say a few words on the side uh, of the nanostructures, you know, obviously creating nanostructure where the electrode diminishes a few tens of nanometers of, you know, creating the structure with the morphologies well controlled is not so easy anymore because the electrode size is fairly small. And this is a typical example here in uh, the position of magnetic uh, uh, pole tip structures for recording heads, where we have uh, conditions for additive adsorption, uh, which are quite different. For example, on the very left, we pretty much don't have any saccharine at the surface because the potential is too far negative and we do pulsing and we have very rough uh, uh, structures which are useless, these devices are not performing. Then, if we reduce the pulse current density and potential of the surfaces somewhere uh, in the region where uh, additives coverage is about 50%, we see uh, improvement. These structures eventually will result in device which is performing, but not so much yet uh, satisfactory. And eventually, if we design the process and tune the uh, pulse current density, so the potential of the surface is in about the region where the PCC is, which is about 100% coverage. Then you can see uh, the structures look perfect and this device performs well. All right, uh, so uh, before I go to the next uh, part, which is electrolyzed deposition, I would like to say that this, uh, in general, for the purest is not electrode deposition because we assume chemical drying force for reduction of the ions. But I will need to mention a few things for you so that you can get smoothly into the next chapter or the next part of the instruction uh, presented by the Dr. Vasilio. So, electroless bulk metal deposition is a process where basically we don't have any potential control over the cell. We just uh, 
they use chemical reducers, which are substances that uh, um, undergo oxidation process and give an electron to the metal ions who are deposited on the particular surface. So in this particular notation, R is the redu reduction agent and Rn plus is oxidized form of this agent. So in order to understand whether the uh, electrolyte deposition is going to work and whether we are going to get uh, what we want, we need to understand where the solution potential will be. And in order to um, have a good idea about solution potential, we have to do certain measurements. However, we can do also some predictive uh, work where we can actually now do electrochemical characterization of our uh, reduction agent and run the um, basically sweep voltammetry and get uh, current density over potential characteristics uh, and also we can electrodeposit our metal and get also characteristic feature of this uh, voltammetry and if they both for example um, follow the TAPU regime then uh, we can go to certain basic math and, math and uh, describe the solution potential in terms of the kinetic parameters of the electro reduction of our metal and electro-oxidation of our reducing agent. And then we can also estimate the uh, deposition rate of our uh, electrolyzed process, which in this case is reflected in this uh, current density that we can calculate. Uh, here's an example where people uh, use uh, dimethyl aminoboran to reduce cobalt iron alloy electrolytically. And you can see that basically mixing solution shifts this um, uh, limiting current density for both metal and dimethyl and boron, and uh, the position rate increases with agitation density, which is pretty much well described by the mixed potential theory and equations I gave you there. Um, also, you can see that more mixing uh, also results in more boron. Uh, in the incorporation into the deposit, which makes the deposit soft to a certain extent, but however, after we reach a certain point, uh, more mixing does not uh, anymore contribute to the positive properties of the cold iron boron because too much boron now starts to actually uh, uh, increase the coarsity of these materials. There's a new phenomenon that has been uh, researched uh, in the last few years, which is electroless monoair deposition. So basically, this is electro deposition. Excuse me, this is electroless deposition, but it's not a bulk based formation, it's just a monoair. It's been reported so far for lead uh, and pretty much occurs on every substrate where lead makes uh, under potential deposition. So it's very simple in terms of the properties of the electroless lead monolayer and would be the lead. Monolayer. When we look at the stripping characteristics of the electroless and uh, UPD lead monolayer, we see that pretty much in terms of the dynamics and shape of the stripping, they are uh, quite similar. Uh, the process occurs uh, when we introduce the vanadium 2 plus as a reducing agent in the solution containing lead 2 plus, where the electrode surface is gold, for example, but it could be platinum, could be routine, it could be copper, etc. And what we do have is the formation of the lead monolayer of gold, but also there's also positive hydrogen evolution reaction going on in parallel. If you look at the uh, uh, open circuit potential, when you introduce the uh, vanadium into the lead containing solution, uh, for example, uh, for the gold surface, it drops and basically it stabilizes a few millivolts above the uh, lead reversible potential, which means all the time uh, your open circuit potential is in under potential range for lead where only lead monolayer could be stable and uh, just to give you a pictorial uh, description of that you see here this is the lead upd wave from the other picture and you can see that basically the open circuit potential drifts through the region where basically the monolayer uh, of lead forms on the gold surface. Uh, how this really happens uh, is an uh, interesting uh, catalytic phenomenon. 
and the description of this phenomenon is a little bit longer. I'm going to just give you a few other species of this process. So basically, uh, we have uh, vanadium as an electron donor, uh, and then we have hydrogen plus and lead plus two plus ions that are reduced. So what we really have is basically balance between electron donor reactions, which represents the vanadium uh, oxidation reaction on the clean gold and on the gold surface covered by the monolayer lead. And then we have the electron user uh, reactions, which is the hydrogen evolution reaction on the monolayer lead covered gold and hydrogen uh, uh, reduction uh, reaction on the clean gold surface and then we have reaction of lead deposition. When we balance these uh, rate uh, equations and we simplify a uh, certain notation where we make the delta Rs being equal to difference in the electron producing reaction and electron uh, and hydrogen uh, uh, reduction on the gold surface, and we do the same this for the vanadium, uh, for the lead covered uh, gold surface, and we introduce this workout uh, math. We end up with a really nice description how the coverage of the electroless lead monolayer depends on time in terms of all these uh, parameters. And if you assume that uh, adsorption is a term for gold, uh, lead UPT on gold is valid also for representing the adsorption or the position of electroless lead, then you can end up with a full uh, model describing the <coughs> truly uh, coverage uh, or uh, potential of the uh, electric surface drift during the electroless deposition of the lead on both surfaces as a function of time. Um, so more uh, papers on this process are coming up. You know, we already shown this process happening on ruthenium, and there are a few more surfaces that are in preparation, platinum and uh, copper as well. So with this, I will uh, finish my presentation, and Dr. Vasilievich will be taking over and presenting uh, particular applications of Electric deposition for energy storage and energy conversion devices. Thank you very much.